It's good to be here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Keith Wilson. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Amanda, and we have four wonderful children, Noah, Abraham, Eden, and Ezekiel. And it's our very good pleasure to be with you today and to be able to share a word with you. Um, Today I'd like to speak about, um, from the entire Bible, about women and the trouble with submission. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm just kidding, y'all. We ain't talking about that. (laughs) Oh, just alienate half the audience, you know. That was a joke. Come on, we're not talking about that today. Oh, that's funny. I don't care who you are. All right, so um, I want to appreciate everybody for the worship this morning. It was really good, and I guess you guys started around 12, so it is this afternoon. Uh, We appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak here. Uh, We appreciate Jason and Amanda. And I just want to share with you that, um, you know, we need to lean into those that are doing the work in the ministry. Amen. And I think Jason and Amanda are wise and they have integrity. They are loving people. So let's love on them a little bit. Support them in every way you can. It's not an easy work, the work of ministry. And it takes a lot of labor, and that can be taxing from time to time, and a lot of energy, sometimes all of your energy. And we do know that we don't follow men. We follow Yeshua. Amen? But there are those who yet remain that do labor for the Lord and are doing a good thing, and so they're worthy of double honor. Let's make sure that that you remember that, and I'll expect that $20 later, Jason. Like he said, though, um, he did not tell me what to speak on today. This is a thing that I've been thinking about and praying about and that I feel like Yahweh is leading us in. And so uh, we just want to get right into that message. As we think about the upcoming Feast of Unleavened Bread, you remember that Moses' plea to Pharaoh was, Let my people go, and I plan to let you go at some point today. I don't know how long from now that'll be, but you will be released. Amen. I was thinking about this and writing things down, and I was told Amanda that I would need a couple of hours this morning to prepare and write for the message. And uh, when she woke up and we were milling about, she said, I thought you were going to to be working on the message. And I said, I'm afraid if I write anything else, it's going to turn into a really long, drawn-out affair. So I'm, I tried to cut it short, and hopefully we can honor your time today. There are three things that a person does in their life that starts the journey of experiencing the gospel, and that is to search, to surrender, and to submit. Search, surrender, and submit. And young people, I, Amanda and I have served in youth ministry now for well over a decade, and what we know about young people is that they're constantly searching as children grow up into adolescence and they move from the dependent stage of life where they're dependent on mom and dad to feed them and to take care of them. Mom and dad are teaching them and training them in the ways of righteousness. They move from the dependent stage of life into what we all know is the glorious time of independence. How, can you, how many of you can attest to a teenager's call for independence? Amen? Amen. And it's, as I, wanted, I just want to remark on this, it is funny that youth ministry is often um, the combination of uh, young people in the most volatile, potentially the most volatile time of their life. They're experiencing uh, sexual changes, physical changes, emotional changes, chemical changes. They have all of these decisions to make about life and what they're going to do and who they're going to spend the rest of their life with. And now we throw identity in there and all of these other things that they're thinking about. And, and we feel like it's wisest to put uh, that class of people and to, and to put somebody in charge to lead them with almost no experience, with almost no training. Young people is what we're asking for. And I just think that's so funny. That youth ministry is led by one of the most immature and untrained group And uh, we're training this crazy class of people called teenagers. And yet the rest of us just sit back and wonder why youth ministry sometimes doesn't work. Well, 
That's probably blind. So teenagers and young people alike and old people alike, as they interact and they are met face to face with the gospel, they go through this three phases, to search, to surrender, and to submit. And when a person meets the gospel, they're confronted with choice. How will I respond to the message that I've heard? How many of you have responded to a message that you've heard before? You heard something, and what the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2, after uh, Peter gave his address, it says they were pierced to the heart. It's like somebody took a spear and just drove it straight through them. The word moved into them and transformed them, and, con- and they were confronted with a choice. And that is exactly what they said to Peter after being pierced in the heart. They said to the brethren, what shall we do? Because conversion or conviction, if you will, does not simply rest in the seats of the pulp or of the of the pews, but it is a call to change. It's a call to move. Conviction is by nature active. And so what they were saying is we've received the message, we're convicted. Now tell us what to do. And that's when Peter said, repent each one of you and be baptized in the name of Yeshua for the remission of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So once we go through the searching process, you know, we're trying to find answers. We're trying to discover the things about this world, the nature of this world. We're going through the different choices of atheism and and religion and and self-indulgence, and we're searching for the truth. Once we come to the truth, then we're met with the surrender. Because naturally, if you're looking for truth and you don't have it, and you find it, you have to surrender to it. You have to hold up your hands and say, I don't know. Teach me. surrender. Now some people like we discussed today will see and and hear the gospel and they will refuse to surrender. They won't accept it. They're going to keep and stay inevitably in search mode. Like your phone when it's looking for signal and it just the circle, right? I don't know if it's the same thing on an apple, but on my phone is a circle. You know, it just, it's a never-ending circle, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and we've become so impatient because it should work immediately, and I agree, it should. People get stuck in search mode because they won't surrender to the truth. Do you know somebody right now who's stuck in search mode? You try to tell them. I've got the answer. One of my favorite musicians is John Mayer. And John Mayer says in one of his songs, something's missing. And I just want to tell John, you're right. And I know what it is. It's Yeshua. You're missing him. A person cannot be complete until they come face to face and surrender to Yeshua. This is where we discover the truth of the gospel. Maybe it discovers us. We learn about Yahweh, His only begotten Son, Yeshua, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We confess with our mouth that Yeshua is Lord. We believe in our hearts that Yahweh raised Him from the dead, according to Romans chapter 10. And then we believe in the gift of grace, which leads us to salvation. We believe that what was once dead is now alive. What was once dead is now alive. So we search, 
for love, for meaning, for purpose, security, safety, significance, constant searching. Then we meet Yeshua and we have to submit to him. And that's where we find the answers to all those questions. We surrender to him. But then there's this third step where I want to spend the next three hours discussing. Submit. Oh boy. That's a tough one. Because between the surrender and the submission stands an enemy. Something gets in the way. And that thing that gets in the way is your heart. I want to share with you an idea here, if you will. Allow me to lay a foundation of the American attitude, if you will. Can I be so bold as to generalize the entire American attitude? (laughs) We have in Christendom songs, literature, preaching, an overwhelming message from movies and pulpit ministry that God loves you. God loves you. And he wants to find you. Lauren Daigle sings her song about rescue. And I love Lauren Daigle. He wants to find you. He wants to He wants to throw everything out in a reckless love to save you. And this all may be true. The Bible does say that Yahweh did love the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, right? So certainly, Yahweh loves us. He loves people. Paul said, that Messiah died at the right time because we were still yet sinners when he died, remember? Yet in our sins, Messiah, expressing his love for us, dies so that we might be saved. Yes, the message is true, that Yahweh loves you. The question that I have for each person today, and please don't answer it, think on it, is do you love Yahweh? I want you to ask yourself, do I love Yahweh? Because the message that we hear is that Yahweh loves me, and it's always persistent. Yahweh loves you. He's a good, good father. These messages are important. They're real. They're true. But yet there comes time for a response. Come on, somebody. A response to that love. It's not just about surrendering, but there's another call. And that is what? To submit to him. And sometimes people get stuck in the surrender part and they never submit. They don't move. Once I worshipped the wood and the stone, but then I found the truth. And I decided to respond to Yahweh. And I put away the idols of the world. I chose in an act of human will and submission of my own heart to be submissive to Yahweh. Hallelujah. Brethren, we can't forget to submit. Every single day of our life, there is a war that is raging right here. It is a war that is being waged between you, the fleshly person, full of sin and lust, and you, the spiritual person, which Yeshua put inside of you as you went under the water and came out, resurrected as a new creature, a new life. And those two people are constantly pulling after each other. At some point, we will read the Bible today, I assure you. T. 
two people inside of you. One is the spirit, one is the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. One of them loves Yahweh, one of them hates him. Let's just read that briefly. Rome, and I'm, I have to apologize, I didn't bring my own Bible today because, well, I don't know how I forgot it, but I just did. So you'll have to bear with me here as I seem uneducated and that I don't know what the word of Yahweh says. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. For the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward Yahweh because it does not, what? It does not submit itself to Yahweh's what? That's right. And it's unable to do so. Those who are of the flesh cannot please Yahweh. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of Yahweh lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, he does not belong to him. Hallelujah. The fleshly man refuses to submit. All kinds of excuses are made every day for not submitting to the will of Yahweh in your life and in mine. We have heart problems. A wayward heart. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 which is sort of the theme of today's message. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. Yeshua here is quoting Isaiah. He says in verse 3, why do you break Yahweh's commandment? Because of your tradition. For Yahweh said, honor your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, whoever tells his, mother, his father or his mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me as a gift committed to the temple, he does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have revoked Yahweh's word because of your tradition. Hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's exactly what Jason was saying. You can sit in the chair. You can say the words. You can sing the songs. That doesn't mean he has your heart. Amen? You're the deciding factor on that point. Will I submit to him? They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And this isn't just about Christendom, by the way. Any religion has the doctrines and teachings of men, even messianic faith. So don't feel too lofty. Amen? The Sabbath can be a God on, uh, all of itself. Which is why Yeshua correctly said the Sabbath was made for men, not men for the Sabbath. We must put everything in its proper order, Yahweh first and above all. I have been in assemblies that kiss the Torah scroll. I'm not interested in kissing pieces of paper. I don't mean to offend you, but I worship Yahweh, and he doesn't dwell in a piece of paper. He's spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let us be careful about our condemnation, and yet also be clear about our choices. Careful on the condemnation, clear on our choices. I'm not going to bring that tree into my house and decorate it. Amen. Not going to do it. 
Why? Because let me tell you a little story. Keith right now, that's me, is listening to the Bible in 90 days. And I'm listening to it at a 1.5 speed. That means I'm trying to move quickly. Two is just too fast. I can't, my, my, my mind can't keep up. For those of you who listen to two, hats off to you. That's, that's really doing something. But one and a half is fast enough. Now, 30 to 40 minutes of listening every day. And I'm not bragging here. This is the first time I'll ever have ever done this. You guys have read the Bible a million times. You're better than me. It's all good. Here's the overarching thing that I've learned about reading the Bible that quickly. Are you ready? Yahweh is concerned with one primary thing, and that is he wants your heart. Stop whoring around with the idols of the world. That's it. It's the prophets. It's the kings. It's the whole thing is stop being unfaithful to me. Why is it that I am not good enough for you? Why is it that when I say this shall be a sign between me and my people, you say I'm not interested in your signs? I'd like to do what I want to do. Why is it that when I say to burn the ashram and to, and to, and to slay the people that are sending their children through the fires, you're like, but we like the fire. Having your orgies and your, your sexual stuff going all and on and on with that idolatry. And here we are in American culture and we're, we have a hard time putting two and two together because it's for the children. No, it's for the devil. Don't tell me the Yule log is for the kiddos. Come on, somebody. Jesus. All right, we got to keep going. These people praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I'm not trying to be so, so um, confrontational, but folks, we, we have to submit. We have to take the things that are being presented to us and determine. It's, it's like that scene on Willy Wonka. You remember when the golden egg is rolling down from the gooses, you know, and they land on the scale and it's like good or bad? <laughs> That's the bad one. What was the name of the girl? Somebody, Baruch. <laughs> How many of us could tell she was bad from the very beginning of the movie? Yeah, me too. But it took the scale to fix. Some of us, some of the rest of us were like, I don't think there's anything wrong with Baruch. Well, there was. That's messed up. Anyway, come on. We need to determine what's good and what's not good. What is holy and that which is not holy. What is clean and that which is not clean. This is the, I'm going to get to this in a minute, but this is the basic requirement, by the way. Minimum obligation. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to uh, share a brief word that, that I feel like Yahweh shared with me. And of course, when I say that, I don't mean like Yahweh and I have a direct line of communication. What I simply mean is that I, my mind was open to something that I was not open to before. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 39, I was listening to Isaiah's uh, dissertation, as it were, his explanation and summary of Hezekiah. And I remember thinking, well, I think Hezekiah was a pretty good guy. Of all the kings, he was rated like pretty close to the top. Number one guy. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, he was, a, he was a good king. Nobody wants to commit now that I've set you up. You're like, I don't know if I should agree to that or not. Let's, I'll just wait it out and see how this turns out. Then I'll go back and make agreements. I don't blame you. I've been trapped if I'm from pulpit ministry before too. Like, I, I don't know. He's about to bait and switch me. Well, here's the thing about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was doing everything right. As a matter of fact, when the news came that Hezekiah was about to die in the book of Isaiah chapter 38, put your affairs in order, Isaiah says in verse 2, for you are about to die, or verse 1 rather, for you are about to die and you will not recover. No one wants to hear that, by the way. And Hezekiah turned his face, verse 2, 
to the wall and he prayed to Yahweh and he said this words, are you ready? Please, Yahweh, remember how I have walked before you faithfully. That's the thing that Yahweh wants, the faithfulness. Don't go whoring around, be faithful. That's what we want, by the way, from each of our spouses too, in case you were unaware. When you signed the prenup, it included faithfulness. Oh, y'all didn't did a prenup? Oh, that's where you went wrong right there. Not about trust. Never been about trust. Accountability. Accountability. <laughs> that's terrible. All right, I just, I lost you, but here we go. Faithfully. He said this, I have served you, I've walked before you faithfully and what? Wholeheartedly. In the New American Standard, the correct version, it says, with my whole heart. That's just for Jason. With my whole heart. Yahweh had Hezekiah's heart, and he said so. I've given you my heart. And what? And then he goes on to say all these things, and what does Yahweh do? He says, all right, fine. Maybe you do deserve another 15 years. No problem. Granted. Well, it's a good day. Hallelujah. And then chapter 39. At that time... Merodach, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon. I want to tell you something right now. Babylon, when you read the word Babylon, I want you to think to yourself, red flag. Red flag. Babylon is not where I belong. So here's the Babylon, uh, the king of Babylon. He sends a letter and a gift to Hezekiah. A gift to Hezekiah. And he says that he heard that he was sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was what? Pleased with them. And he showed him the treasures of his house. The issue of the heart is, th is that we're trying... We're trying to get Babylon out. And Babylon is constantly trying to get in. We are gatekeepers, if you will, to our own hearts. And this is the struggle between that which is spiritual and that which is fleshly. And here Hezekiah, having received a miracle, a divine miracle from Yahweh, having lived his entire life in faithfulness, comes to this pivotal moment in his life where Babylon is saying, hey, I'd like to come hang out with you. And he says, come on. Faithfulness is not about a moment. It's about a journey. It's constant. It's every single day. We win, we lose. That's fine. But we keep going. When Babylon comes knocking, we don't say, come on. Look what it says here. Verse 3, the prophet came to the king Hezekiah and asked him, where did these men come from and what did they say to you? And Hezekiah replied, they came to me from a distant country, from Babylon. And Isaiah said, what have they seen in your palace? I'd like to ask, if you don't mind, if we could submit that this palace is not a place, but in fact was Hezekiah's heart. Our house is our heart. And this is what Hezekiah said to him. They have seen everything in my palace. They've seen everything in my heart. And there isn't anything of all my treasuries that I didn't show them. I gave them the whole thing. They saw every bit of it. Not one secret, not one thing sacred, not one thing holy was reserved for the Father. I gave them everything. And then Isaiah said, hear the words of Yahweh. You're in big trouble. What does Yeshua say in the book of Matthew about the treasure and the heart? Where your treasure is, there is your heart. And what does Hezekiah show them? He shows them the treasuries. He gave them his heart. 
And this is the battle that each and every single one of us are struggling with where we say this belongs to Yahweh, this ground, this treasury, this heart is his, it's yours. I submit it to you. It does not belong to Babylon. Young people, hear me. If you're under the age of 20, hear me when I say this. Babylon wants you. It's fighting for you. This is the reason people come in swinging like a wrecking ball. They want to get you. It's not meant to be something that is looked upon as disgusting. Babylon is enticing. Its pleasures, its pleasures are fulfilling. That's the, that's the lie. It looks tasty. He let Babylon into his heart. And that's where the treasure is. And then, just to finish the story, Yahweh, of course, curses his whole family. And he's like, well, at least I get to stay, stick around. Isn't it funny that when Hezekiah was faced with sudden and immediate death, his immediate response was to cry out to Yahweh. But now, having been cursed, but yet remaining for, we assume, somewhere around 15 years, we don't know exactly when this king of Babylon came, but it was pretty close to the time of the proclamation when he was healed. So he's got 15 years guaranteed. Guess what he says? I've got mine. I'm good. I'll forget about my family. You guys are in big trouble, but me, I'm, I'm taken care of. Why didn't he again go to Yahweh and again repent? Is Yahweh unable to hear two times? Is he unable to save two times? Do you see? Babylon took over. Didn't need Yahweh anymore. I got my time. I got my money. Sorry about your bad luck, everybody else. His response was no longer humility. His response was pride. And pride is the very thing inside of our hearts that's constantly rejecting the word of Yahweh and bringing in the cascading temptation of Babylon. I need to wrap this thing up at some point here. Let me just say this. Paul warns the Romans when talking about Israel's disobedience, when talking about Israel's faithlessness, he said this, do not be arrogant toward the branches. Because it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. If Yahweh, in his unlimited capacity for love and mercy and compassion and grace, is able to cast Israel aside because of their disobedience and their unbelief, by the way, two things two qualifications, disobedience and unbelief, if he is willing to do that to the very people he called from the hellfires of Egypt, if he's willing to do that to him, what do you think he's going to do to you? These are the people he loved, he promised, and he is faithfully committed to. You are a honored guest. Amen? And I'm thankful to be an honored guest. Hallelujah! But I cannot act arrogantly towards Israel. Don't ever let the arrogance, the pride of life, fill us up. Oh, I keep Shabbat. Hallelujah. I celebrate the fest. Hallelujah. I know what hallelujah means. Hallelujah. Yes, please say it. Believe it. Trust it. But don't get arrogant. Don't let the pride of the treasure, because it's all sides, friends. The way is narrow, by the way. It was never meant to be easy. Narrow, difficult, purposeful, intentional. Babylon offers you the easy way out. All are invited. Wide is the gate and the way that leads to death. Christy Jordan says this. I, I don't want to say that yet. Let me just say this. <clears throat> How do we know that we love Yahweh? All these messages, Yahweh loves you, God loves you. 
How do I know that I love him? How is anybody to know? What does the Bible say? Let's look at 1 John. And I know you're familiar with this, but we cannot escape the importance of what John says here. This is how we are sure, he says in verse 3 of chapter 2, that we have come to know him by keeping his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, that is, to submit to him, rather, even, well, we could say submit, but surrender, yet does not keep his commandments, is a liar. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to me. Every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down. Your fruit can either be used to bless people in the tree sense, like I'm producing fruit and other people are blessed, or your fruit can be firewood, keeping people warm. Think about that will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the only thing you do with a tree that's not producing fruit. You use it for firewood. It burns. We must remember that there is something to submitting and obedience to Yahweh's word. Whoever keeps his word, truly him, in him, the love of Yahweh is perfected. This is how we know we are him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. And this is why I tell people, not in an arrogant or prideful, egotistical way, I hope, I follow Yeshua. So I, because I'm not following men, I'm not following doctrines, I'm not following denominations, I'm not following books and rules. I follow Yeshua. I want to follow Yeshua. Maybe I'm not doing it perfectly. You could definitely point that out, sure. Lots of room for improvement, but my goal is to follow him, not following pastor so-and-so. I follow Yeshua. This pulpit here is not so you'll follow this. This thing is not for you to follow. You follow Yeshua. This is so that we can share something with people. That's all it's for. You follow Yeshua. Don't follow me. Follow him. This is how we know that we have come to know him by keeping his commandments. Obedience is the fruit, not the root. That's what Christy Jordan said. Obedience is the fruit, not the root. It's not the reason you're saved. It's the because of I'm saved. I'm not celebrating the Sabbath day so that Yahweh will like me more. He likes me Not because I'm a likable person. He likes me, loves me, because of his son. He likes his son. Really. Likes his son. And because we are clothed in the righteousness of Yeshua, Yahweh is able to look at us and call us acceptable. It's not because of what I'm doing. I don't celebrate the commandments. I don't. I don't worship in that way so that Yahweh will love me more. I I do it so that I can say, I love you. This is my response. It's what we do. And then I want to share this with you. Again, not to think too highly of yourself. Let's look at Luke chapter 17 as I conclude here. Luke chapter 17. This is important. Yeshua showed, th- showed me this. You guys probably knew this a long time ago, but he just recently showed it to me, and I was thankful for it. Luke chapter 17 was an interesting parable that I hadn't heard many times in my upbringing in the Sacred Dame Assembly, probably because of its scathing meaning here. Let's look at what he says. Let's just start in verse 5. The apostles said to the Master or the Lord, increase our faith and Yeshua replies and he says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed you can say to this mulberry tree be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you 
And then he says this really interesting thing here. Which one of you, having a slave, tending sheep or plowing, will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down here and eat? Instead, will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat, get it ready, serve me while I eat and drink, later you can eat and drink. Does he thank that slave because he did what was commanded? Mm -mm. You should say, what? We are good for nothing, slave. We've only done our duty. We've only done our duty. Keeping the Sabbath is not a badge of righteousness. It's minimal requirement. Celebrating the Sabbath is about submitting and receiving the blessing. It's not about, I'm cool because of. We have to remember that when Yahweh says, thus you shall do, this is the minimal requirement. This is what he's commanding. It's an expectation. It's sort of like when you roll the dice in Monopoly, you move the pieces. It's what comes next. It's the response. It's the submission. It's the very minimal. It's the basics. If you really want to achieve more for the kingdom of Yahweh, then why don't we think about what Yeshua said. He said, you guys tithe and you do all this stuff. What you should have done is you should have thought about justice and mercy and faithfulness. How about serving people that are, that are hurting and healing the sick and, and clothing those without clothes and feeding those without food and, and putting shoes on people's feet? Then you can start talking to me about merit. I don't want to hear anything about you keeping the festivals and being all cool about it. Minimal requirement. This is faithfulness. It's a contract. It's like being married and being like, well, I didn't cheat on you today. Do I get anything for that? No. This is, the, this is what we agreed on. You know, I brought you a dozen roses. Do I get anything for that? Yeah, you're darn right you do. You don't get any points for faithfulness. Come on, somebody. Uh, well, congratulations. You've satisfied the minimal requirements for marriage. I don't know what you want from me. This is what it is to obey, to be obedient, to submit. Hallelujah. Let's not get lofty because we're doing the minimal. Let's consider ourselves like the slaves did. We're good for nothing. It's only by his grace and his mercy that we're even here. Hallelujah. Somebody tell me that you know this because somebody told you. What does Paul say? How, what do you have that wasn't told to you? What gift do you have that wasn't given? Amen? The whole thing is a big gift. He just gives it to you. And you, it's not, I, I, I changed my verbiage. When I'm in a restaurant and, and, and people are like, you know, I'm ordering this and I'm like, does it have bacon on it? You know, does it have this or that? And they're like, well, I, I can't eat bacon. That's not a true statement. I can eat all the bacon in the world I want. I can have mouthfuls of bacon everywhere. I changed my verbiage. I don't eat bacon. This is a choice that I'm making. I don't eat that. I don't go there. I don't do that. Not because I have to, but because I get to. Amen. It's a response. It's submission. Oh, well, my mom and dad said I can't have that, so I guess I won't. No, I won't because I won't. You know, Yahweh wants this heart of ours. It's like when your kids say, do I have to? How many of you like that statement when a kid says, do I have to? You know his heart's not in it. Do I have to take out the trash? What I want is for you to want to take out the trash. That's what I want. I want you to want it. But if you're not going to want to, at least do it. And please stop with all this stuff. That would be great. You don't have to. You get to. 
Amen? Let's be careful when we're thinking about serving Yahweh. That we don't become too lofty. That we don't get stuck in the, eye, in the question of, do I have to? Mm-mm. Do I have to keep the... If I say this question, do I have to keep the Sabbath to be saved? What I'm really telling you is, I have a heart problem. I don't like to submit to the will of the Almighty. That's what I'm really saying. Do I have to stop doing this or that to to be saved? Like, what are we asking right now? For the minimal requirements? Do you want to know, like, if you just do these things, then you're going to be okay. But, I mean, you'll barely make it by. You know, it's like me in French, you know. If it weren't for Amanda, I wouldn't have passed French because I did the very minimal. I copied her homework. I got, you know, I asked the teacher for help on tests. You know, I didn't, I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. I don't, still don't know any French, you know. Two years of wasted time because my heart wasn't in it. Don't want to learn French. Now I regret it because French is like one of the most romantic languages out there, right? If I knew French, you guys would be real impressed, right? I could impress you right now. My bad. You know, when we come to the table, let's not ask the question, do I have to, to get by? All right, I think I'm satisfied my requirement here. I want you to know that I love you. I don't know many of you, but Yahweh be with you. Thank you for your time today. Let's pray as we conclude this message. Father Yahweh, we pray that you would give us a heart that is willing to submit to you. Yahweh, a heart that says, I want to serve you. I want to obey you. I want to live for you. Not a heart that says, do I have to? I don't want to. What will this cost me? Let us be a people that lays down our lives daily, dies daily to you. To what, not to you, but to ourselves for you. Yahweh, I pray that your spirit would lead us in truth and in wisdom, not to be deceived by the doctrines of men who constantly convolute your story and your message. Yahweh, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be devoted to you solely, like in a marriage. Our faithfulness is secure and intact, unwavering. Yahweh, help us to be a light in the things that we do, not arrogantly, not boastfully, not with pride, but Yahweh, merely as an example of right living according to your will, which is laid out in your word, Father. We're so thankful for Yeshua. We're thankful for the fact that he died and that that's the only reason we can even approach you. Thank you for your son. Yeshua, thank you for your sacrifice. We give you thanks, and I pray for your blessing on these people, and especially for the young people who are constantly dealing with Babylon. And everybody says, amen. Amen. Y'all would be with you. Thank you so much for your time.